I guess I haven't got any silver bullets for you, and that's the trouble with flood recovery. Nobody's got, you know, do this and everything will be good. It'll take all the pain away. But I guess when you've had a fairly big flood, there's a lot of things going along in your head. You've got a hundred things you, you think you should be doing, and maybe if I can just point out a few of the major issues, it might help you prioritise what you do next, uh, especially leading into um, the next cropping season or, or if you've managed to get a bit of crop in already. So I guess to start off, um, one of the key things with, uh, and from past experience, is, is waterlogging, obviously, with, with flooding events. And within waterlogging, the most severe thing in terms of nutrition is denitrification. Now, for denitrification to happen, you need no oxygen, so completely waterlogged, sealed up. You need the presence of a carbon source, so you need some material there, whether it be stubble or weeds or whatever, or old crop. Uh, presence of nitrate nitrogen, not ammonia, nitrate's the key, and warm soil temperatures uh, following that, that flood event. So we've probably had all those situations to varying degrees. And those of you, to give you a bit of background, with denitrification is you've got an anaerobic environment in your soil type. So that, stimu that, that uh, stimulates uh, organisms that can handle anaerobic situations. And what they do is they're searching for oxygen, and they haven't got any, so they steal it from nitrates. So they're dropping that oxygen molecule out of that NO3 and taking that, and then when you do that, you're breaking up the, the molecule and you get nitrides and various nitrous oxides. And then as long as they've got a clear pathway to the atmosphere, off they go. So um, what, are the, what are the boundaries on denitrification? Well, I've asked a few uh, experts in the last week about it, and Basically, most of their retorts were, well, how long's a piece of string? So, very much depends on your situation and it's hard to quantify and give you a, a number. But some, some rough ideas is you've got to have at least 24 to 48 hours of a waterlogging situation, and I'd probably stretch it to 48 hours. Um, some work done by the greenhouse gas guys down at QUT. They've, had, they've got a bit of evidence to suggest that they've, they've seen 20 to 30 percent losses of their nitrate nitrogen that's been applied, fertiliser, in, uh, chiefly in irrigation fields, and most of that's been in cotton systems. So I guess if you work on 20 percent being your low figure, and then there's been numbers recorded up to 70 percent and above of your existing nitrate nitrogen. Those, those biggest situations is where you've had probably five days plus of a waterlogging situation. And remember, when we say waterlogging, it's not necessarily about water sitting on top, but it's, 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 if you've got a profile that is physically full and, and, and it's, you, you just can't do anything with it, that's a waterlogged situation. So anybody who's seen a freshly irrigated cotton crop that it, it may be not as well drained as it should be, they've got waterlogging situations usually for 24 hours after a, a flood irrigation. Um, experiences from the Darling Downs in 2011, was they had massive losses to nitrification. But if you take your mind back to that situation, they pretty much had almost two months where you could say, oh, waterlogged, they had a big rain event before Christmas, they had one straight after Christmas, and then they had another one two weeks later. They had two flooding events officially, um, and they basically, it was just sopping wet. And, and when you have it that wet, that you basically have a column of water from your profile to the atmosphere and it's perfect for, for your nitrous oxides just to go to the atmosphere. So they almost lost nothing to leaching, which is surprising, nearly all of it to denitrification. So that gives you the top end of the scale. And, and from what I hear from you guys up here, it was a fairly fast flood. So denitrification in those areas where it's trap water is probably an issue. But in general terms, if the water's come on and gone off fairly quickly, you may not have suffered too, too big a losses. But nitrogen is going to be the key thing uh, when you're going to try and recrop that country and, and put the next crop in. I guess the other, uh, another key one is that loss of topsoil. And it, from what I've seen, some of the photos that Haley sent down the other day, there's a few of you guys that are, are dealing with that and will be your biggest, biggest issue. Uh, that's, that's probably some of the most severe topsoil loss I've ever seen, I think. But I guess there's a few issues with topsoil. And those of us who've been in a zero-till system for a long time, the system tends to have a stratification of nutrients in that top area because we're not mixing and cultivating. As your stubble lies down and dies and gets broken down, you tend to have a lot of nutrients sitting in that topsoil. 
especially elements like potassium and phosphorus that don't move a lot. They're immobile, so they, they stay up in that, that area. So when the flood comes through and takes across 10 centimetres, you've lost big lumps of phosphorus and, and potassium. And, and, of, and of course, a whole heap of other things, sulphur that's, that's uh, in there as well. Um, the other big thing is you've lost organic matter, organic carbon. And organic carbon does a few things. One, organic carbon is, is one, some of your glue that holds your soil together in that top soil, provides a bit of structure and pathways for rainfall infiltration and for pathways for oxygen and, and, and that exchange of gases. The other thing that organic matter is, it's the home for your microbes, okay? And microbes control an enormous amount of the rates of, of mineralization and rates and converting of your nutrient nutrients. So you've effectively lost that source of new nutrients. Now the mineralization, especially for elements such as nitrogen and sulfur, you're losing that source. Um, you'll still have a bit there, but, but you, you've lost the, the, the real engine room, the top 10 centimeters of your ground, it's the real engine room for those elements. And nitrogen and sulfur moves quite well, so it moves down the profile and, and replenishes the rest of your profile. The other thing, just talking about lack of mineralization and microbes, is you're losing beneficial fungi, such as VAM or vascular muscular mycorrhiza, for those who want to get technical. Now VAM is a really important uh, fungi, um, especially for the uptake of phosphorus and zinc. It provides a big surface area for the plant to be able to forage for that element. And uh, so what you're facing when you're losing your topsoil, you've lost your VAM, you're effectively facing a long fallow situation. So you're going to have to uh, make up for the fact that you haven't got that for the time being. And the third one that comes to mind um, with, with a major flooding event is hard setting surfaces. Now hard setting can come from a few different ways, but one of the main things is just the pure volume of water you have through your topsoil and most of your clay soils uh, you've basically diluted or flushed out a whole heap of electrolytes or, or minerals, I suppose, in that top. And they're pretty important in terms of if people are familiar with things like cation exchange capacity. Um, that's where, if you can imagine that clay solid there, very thin, and your clay colloids are made up of hundreds and hundreds of them. And that's how they store your, your cation. That's where your cation exchange complex is, and that's where it's storing a lot of the nutrients. And when you get a big gut full of water through it, you're basically distributing those over a, a wider area or you're flushing them out completely. And those positive and negative charges upsets all that balance and you, you're losing one of the abilities that a clay soil has to keep its structure. So then it settles out, all the fines, because clay when you break it down is quite fine, it all settles out and forms uh, you know, like cement, a, a dense layer, and, and that has implications on aeration, getting oxygen through your profile. And it also impacts on your water, uh, your rainfall efficiency. So when it rains again, that hard setting surfaces is going to have an impact on how much you get back in the profile. So does that mean that we should go through the work ground and mix that in? Yeah, if you've got a hard setting is a real problem, you're going to have to do some sort of mechanical tillage. Um, and that's not only just for that, but you know, I, I've seen some photos there where it's that rough, you'd be flat out getting a tractor on there. So, you know, you're going to have to get conditions back into some sort of soil tilt that you can make a planning opportunity work for you. And I guess, and I'll, I'll talk about this with Rodney, do you want me to go on or just talk about, where's, are we moving on or are we splitting this into two sessions? Okay. So um, those are the three main things I see with, with flooding issues. Now, the, the other few slides I've got is maybe some suggested ways of, of getting ready for the next crop. We're going to split it into two sessions, so that's all I had in this session. Um, any questions about, everybody understands what I talked about on, on those three points. Is there any areas that you need more clarification on? I guess in terms of that, if you, if you want to prove it to yourself, take a bit of clay soil and drop it in a glass of water, and you'll notice that it just collapses, and that's effectively what you know big flooding does. So the weight of the water doesn't cause The weight of the water can it obviously helps with that. So you don't have a lot of resistance um, to stopping that compaction, and then you've got you know a ton of water on top as well, um, makes it just that little bit worse and starts squashing it up as well. The other thing too is in high clay soils, high pH clay soils. Sometimes they tend to be, uh, have a, a reasonable fraction of sodium in there as well. 
and sometimes sodium can come to the, come to the surface a bit and it, it's like a triple whammy as well and it, it doesn't help you, it, it helps flocculate out. And an easy way to tell if you've got high sodium in your surface soil is again chuck it in the water and if the water goes cloudy, it's also a sodium issue which is a chemical distribution. It's, it's a big molecule that forces those, those clay cells apart and then they break their, their electronegativity attraction and then they can just go anywhere and settle out. Anything else on those three points that I've talked about so far? Well, um, yeah, silt patches is another, another animal, again, and I, I haven't really figured out an absolute great way for silt to deal with silt patches, but Tim Neal's here, and I'm sure he'll have some impact on it, but in severe situations, I've actually, I've actually let weeds grow on the silt patches to dry them out, because to me, the secret with silt patches is dry them out, spread them out as quick as you can. And drying them out, because they're so, you can't physically get a machine on there, if you've got something growing, dry the bugger out, as long as they don't go to seed, you don't want the weeds to go to seed, but if there's something growing there, just let it go for a while, dry it out, and then you might be able to get, just get something in there just to, to spread it enough that you can get a planter through. Yeah, that, that's my concept, and um, I'm sure Tim's probably got other ideas how to do that, but um, yeah, but I, I guess on your other country, you know, it's the same thing, weed control is essential because it's stealing moisture from you. Um, and I, I guess it's a, it's a fine line when you're coming out of a flood. You want to protect what you've got, you know, so ideally you want to crop in there as soon as you can, but um, obviously there's some preparation to go and, and you need some aeration, so you need some tillage, but you don't want in the next rainfall event to lose a heap more soil. So it's really horses for courses, you know, you've got to, you've got to say, well, that bit of country, I, could probably, I really need to do something with it, I might totally rip it, this country here, I might... I might open the rippers out, I might you know, do it on a metre and a half or something or you know, be conscious of that balancing act between getting water in but not losing what you've got, trying to protect what you've got. I guess the other thing about uh, nitrogen losses and denitrification, what I would suggest is, is soil testing, perhaps you know, in your mind the worst patches where you had the water sitting on for the longest, get a soil test there pick a part where the, soil, the water was on for a little while but not too long, soil test there, and then pick a spot where you didn't have any water logging at all, and that'll give you a bit of an idea of the sort of parameters or the percentage of nitrogen you might have lost, given roughly they're all the same soil type, of course, but, you know, take that into account. Um, I, uh, Dave Lester, down on the Darling Downs, he did say some guys actually got it really technical and they quantified the areas that were the deepest flooding and they did a topo map with their GPS, you know, with your tractor systems apparently now you can do a topo. So they set up a map where they had deep water, shallow water, no water, and they fertilised according to that and built that into their, their, their system. But that's pretty high tech, that's why out there, and if you can do that, great. Um, it might save you a bit of money than having to just go blanket approach. Uh, anything else on those, those sort of technical stuff? Anything you're observing out in the paddock that you don't understand or you're not sure what's happening? Okay, well... Yeah. Um, I guess you, how much time have you got for preparation? But I'm assuming alluvial country, you've got plenty under there. You've got plenty of clay soil under there. And I guess it all depends about that surface structure because to me it's all about planting that next crop. What conditions do I need to get that seed in the ground and get the plant out? Now sometimes in a land plane you get those hard surfaces where it's cut. You know, you're going to have to work on that a bit. But on the loose areas of soil it's going to be almost too loose. Um, so you're going to have some compromise, so you've got it that it can get that next lot of rainfall because you're going to need rainfall and you need it in, in some sort of circumstances that you can plant that. Now, the other thing I'll talk about later is what do you plant with? You know, do you plant with a tine, a disc, a disc, a coulter with a tine behind it? Um, or do you just do a full tillage cultivation? And that might be the easiest, easiest way to do for this first crop, to get the first crop in the ground and your first lot of stubble back on that country. Maybe that's the best way to get get the 
the crop out of the ground. Um, I haven't got an absolute answer for you, but also the robustness of the crop that you grow. You know, I'd suggest in that situation, wheat is probably your best bet. And if you, if, if you miss that, I mean, then sorghum's probably the next one. But low risk, very tough crop. As long as you get a bit of that in-crop rain and you get the secondaries going, it, it'll, it'll do as much as any crop it will be to even that up between the soft patches and the hard patches. And then it, the secret is cropping. You need to have live material in the profile, the root systems, that's a carbon source, living and dying, clay soils need wetting and drying cycles. It's, it's essential to their ability to repair themselves and we're lucky that when we're farming self-mulching clay soils, they have the ability to help us out a bit but it just means that in the first six months you're going to have to help it out and mollycoddle it along a bit. But it will, will come back. Well, and, and I guess there's a couple of different ways. Um, there's going to be some situations where you'll need a full disturbance because it's that rough, you just won't be able to get a tine in it or whatever. Um, if you've still got a little bit of stubble left there and you want to try and keep that in protection, I mean, one way, if you've got real precise uh, planting systems, maybe you rip the lines you're going to plant and that's all you do. And then you leave the stuff there so you've got a bit of resistance to the next, so any rain and, and if it tries to run off, you've got some way of that water going in, but it's, you've got some resistance to, the, to, to shifting topsoil and you get a bit of consolidation. So maybe rip lines where you're going to plant so at least you know you've got some tilth there. Or um, um, oh, my, my aspect is, is you can make the ripping fairly rough because you're going to need rainfall anyway to get the next crop in the ground and hopefully that rain's going to melt down those, those clumps a bit and, and give you some sort of tilt to move on. But I guess it'll be, it'll be horses for courses and you'll have to assess that paddock by paddock sort of thing. Um, and, and that's the trouble with this flood stuff. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a plan for everybody, you know. It's sort of broad concepts and you sort of go, got to go out and have a dig and, 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 and work it out yourself a little bit too. Yeah, it should be. It shouldn't have changed a, a, a great deal. It might, be, it might be a little more compacted, but as you get... I mean, given that that's effectively maybe subsoil down there, and so its, it's soil density might be a bit higher. You know, uh, if you've seen a soil test, your plant density might go, soil density might go 1.1 down to 1.4 over a metre. So it, it'll be a little bit higher, but with drying and wetting cycles, that soil will soon crack open and it's got the same swelling characteristics. So it'll soon turn into a more aerated topsoil. Um, it's just getting that first crop in and getting things started, you know, yeah and getting the cover on the ground, protecting what you've got and starting to work on it. So, you know, yeah, there's no difference. And that's why um, I'm, I'm pretty much telling you everything I've got in the rest of my slides, but anyway. Um, things like potassium that are derived from the mineralogy of the clay, there may still be plenty of potassium there, even though you've lost a fair bit off the top. Um, whereas things like nitrogen, sulphur, and, and most of your phosphorus all comes from the organic matter. So, so uh, things that are, that are maintained, things like uh, calcium and, and potassium, they're still there. They're, they're in the mineralogy and they will release over time as you wet and dry and you grow crops. It'll be awfully slow though. So again, that first crop might suffer because it just doesn't have enough. Um, taproot or, or, or your, your adventitious type crops, I've got a bit of both ways. Uh, in my mind, the low risk, best crops in, in what I've seen in a practical circumstances is wheat and sorghum. They've got good, tough root systems. They're easy to establish. And um, especially wheat with that high surface area, you know, it leaves pretty good tilth. It does as good a job as any. I would also put chickpeas in there because, again, it's a good, a good tough taproot type crop and it will break your country open, but it doesn't leave you with a hell of a lot of stubble afterwards. So it's a bit of a, you know, you've got to balance that up, which do you want? Crops I'd avoid is something like uh, maize or mung beans, not particularly strong, robust root systems. You may differ with me there, but in my experience, maize is a bit of a wimp. As soon as it hits a bit of compaction or things get a bit tough, it sort of gives up a bit. And I've seen crops side by side, corn and sorghum, 
in similar soil types and the sorghum's done half a tunnel better than the corn in, in a similar circumstance. So irrigation suits maize really well because everything's, everything's there and provided for it, but, but the, the breeding systems of, you know, it's high yielding, so it's a bit softer. And, and mung beans, well, it's a shallow root system, you know, and it doesn't particularly, you know, sh uh, crack open as, as much. It doesn't particularly source water as well, and, and it, it only goes down, you know, maybe 50 or 60 centimetres. So that's the way I'd base it on. So not so much tap-rooted or not tap-rooted, but, but just on those crops that have got a proven record, I suppose. Yeah, look, initially with VAM, there's, um, there's really no way of getting around it. It'll, it'll come back in time, but you need living matter in there to do it. So your first crop you're probably going to provide, need, starter Z becomes really important because its primary, its primary booster is it, it, it helps with phosphorus and zinc uptake. So if you haven't got VAM in there, you're going to provide it, and, and especially at the start because your, your young plants haven't got a high surface area. You know, they've got small roots, not a big area, that they're not foraging very well. So that starter Z at planting is particularly important. As that root system gets bigger, it's got a higher surface area, it can forage down the profile and, 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 and possibly make do. Um, but, and then the pure fact that you've got a living, breathing, organic plant happening, uh, growing, um, dying, growing again, and you've got the clays opening up, drying and swelling, the van will come back. There will be, there will be uh, spores around the place and it'll eventually um, uh, re-inhibit, but it'll take a while. You know, it'll, you know, it might be a couple of years before you really see it um, make a difference. Uh, yes, there, there, there's crops that are more suited to it, um, and I just can't. I think um, I think wheat again is is one of the better ones, and um, sorghum to a certain degree, and even corn. But um, the legumes, not as uh, I just can't remember on that. But um, I'm sure there's a document that that gives you some ratings on that. Oh, it may well be in that handout, sorry. I didn't, um, oh, actually, yeah, actually, I think there is something in there. I just can't quite remember, I read it late last night. So. <laughs> uh, not off the top of my head, no. Um, anybody else heard anything more about the inoculant van? It's been, it's been pretty quiet. I know they were talking about it a few years ago, but I, I've sort of been out of circles for the last couple of years, so I'm sort of relearning it all, coming back into it. They'll go, hell yeah, it's great, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good, that's a good short-term work for the, the um, project solution, or the cropping solutions guys, because you've got a perfect, I'm sure you've got some paddocks around here that'd be a perfect trial site to, um, to, to measure, given that I'm sure you, you, you've lost a fair bit of it. What was the result? So you can put it in with your, oh, you probably wouldn't do that, yeah. So you just, like your uh, inoculant system, basically, you just put it through the water. Yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'd imagine there would be some variability between a drier season and a, and a wetter season. And, and um, given we all had pretty good yields, you know, generally we had a pretty good start. If you had a really dry season, you might see a bit more of a difference because it's all about surface area and ability uh, to forage and, and cover the, the ground. And VAM effectively is just a, a great big root system, if you like. Um, and if you've got a drier season where your roots don't get the chance to be as well developed, VAM would then really come into its own because it would, it would give you a bit more. Should be good, yep. So, yep. No, no, like you say, we, you, you're pretty consistent with your cropping, yeah. you, you, as long as you've got a live root system, and even if you've got a lot of weeds, you know, that actually helps as well, keep it, keep it going. Yeah. And it's going to take more than three or four months for the crop to crop anyway. Mm. 